says that we're streaming on my side, Dave. We're streaming? Yes, stand by one second. Go ahead. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to a work session of the Long Beach City Council. Um, a work session is open to the public and it's where you can watch the Kent City Council conduct city business. Um, tonight's work session is a continuation of discussions on a proposal by the city staff to install parking meters in the central business district. With that, I will hand it over to um, Mr. McNally. Thank you, Council President McGinnis. Um, as you noted, tonight's meeting is on <clears throat> parking meters uh, for the Central Business District or the staff's proposal for parking meters for the Central Business District. Specifically, the new element that we're gonna fold in tonight uh, are the, the, the revenues and expenses associated with it. So we fully understand that this is a hot button issue uh, with a significant amount of public uh, interest. So. What, what I wanted to do in queuing up tonight's presentation is to give a review of the process, where we've come from, um, and what everybody can expect from the process moving forward, council, public included. Uh, I would note that we have our parking consultant, Jerry Gioza, um, from Level G Parking on with us tonight. He will be giving the bulk of the presentation before we open it up to questions from the council. We also have Sean Redd and Ed Kincaid um, from Flowbird who are the proposed potential vendor that we have engaged with and begun discussions with. Uh, and we have both Ina Resnick, our city controller, and Ron Walsh uh, and Dave Frazier. Ron Walsh, our police commissioner, and Dave Frazier, our city clerk, who have been part of the internal team deliberating um, and trying to bring this. And of course, uh, Chuck Geiger from our corporation counsel's office, um, all of whom are resources to help answer any questions um, that the council may have. Um, so in terms of background, this administration uh, came into the city two years ago and very quickly uncovered uh, essentially dire finances uh, that was structurally imbalanced annual budgets and staring down the barrel of close to half a billion dollars uh, in debt and long-term liabilities. Uh, staff were quickly charged with trying to find alternative revenue streams beyond those that would just tax the residents through property taxes out of existence. Uh, Sorry, I yes. A message from uh, the city manager on my phone that she's having trouble logging in. So, Dave, if you could address that, please. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so, so really, the charge was making sure that we would not this, you know. Th this long-term debt and the structural imbalances, which were obviously no fault of the residents, uh, we did not want to overly burden the residents to make up those shortfalls and correct the issues of the past um, by just laying them on property tax revenues. So the idea is what other kind of revenue streams can you come up with that visitors to Long Beach would help us to be able to shoulder? Um, the council at that time, two years ago, noted that parking meters could be one such revenue stream. Previous administrations going back really well more than a decade at this stage of the game had explored parking meters as a revenue stream, but it never really mustered the political courage to get it to the, to the finish line. They had looked at parking solutions for the West End, uh, parking meters for the Central Business District. They actually went out to bid for those meters. It went before the council, and I want to say it's 2009, but they only ended up following through with parking meters for the Long Island Railroad parking garage. So when we came in two years ago, we re-engaged with the consultant about a year and a half ago, and staff have been working with the consultant for the better part of the past year to devise a plan that we think would work that would benefit both the business district and the city and our residents in terms of revenue and economic development. So at that, I just want to get on the soapbox real quick to, to, to let it be known, or at least the belief, and, and I think studies bear it out, is free parking is not free. Uh, the taxpayers are bearing the costs for street sweeping, pavement replacing, street lighting. What parking meters hope to do are turn those expenses around to something that is shared by all 35,000 residents to the actual users of the central business district. 
Um, in addition to that, and probably more important than anything in terms of revenue to the city, this is when I, when I mentioned economic development, having parking spaces turn over in front of our local commercial businesses on Park Avenue is immeasurably important. Those, those available spaces, depending on you know, how thriving of a business district you have, represent anywhere between $20,000 and $100,000 a year to those shopkeeps, provided that the spots turn over. I, I think all of us understand right now what's happening is people are parking in a spot. Quite often, it's either a, a shopkeep or an employee, and those spots never open up. Um, I did it the last meeting, and I'll do it again. I'll use Geno's as an example. I can't tell you how many times, and I know this is an example that's shared by most people in town. You want to grab a slice of Geno's, you drive down Park Avenue, there's no spots in front of it, you loop the block once, you might loop it a second time, and then you just give up because there is not a convenient parking space there. The idea behind a parking management system or a parking menu system is to produce that turnover to benefit the businesses in the central business district. You look at Rockville Center, Patchog, any thriving downtown on Long Island has a parking management or parking management or parking meter system. So in sum, that's, those are the rationales for why we are moving forward or why we are proposing this solution. Let me just talk a little bit about process now for, for how this goes forward. As City Council President McGinnis noted, this is the second public working session um, on this proposal from staff. The first one was on January 20th. The second one is tonight. Um, when this administration uh, came into existence two years ago, they decided they wanted to take a, a tack that was more transparent. Meetings like this, meetings like the one that happened on January 20th, where the council was informed about what staff were considering and they went to go solicit feedback, those meetings were always done behind closed doors. If, if, if this administration followed the tact of previous administrations, the public would not be aware of this proposal at all. But they chose the tact and a majority of the council um, here, representative, and I'm sure most of the council or all of the council are in agreement, they chose the tact of wanting to be more transparent. Um, that is a, a great ideal. It is the best way to do public business. It's, it's a matter of open meeting laws, but it does come with its downsides because now information is out there that is not ready for prime time necessarily yet. Th these are discussions between staff and council. Um, so all of this is not finalized yet. Um, and it, and it's, not, it's not what a final solution or a final proposal is as would be presented to the council at a regular meeting. Uh, Case in point of one of the downsides is we've had a local organization take it upon themselves to put out a public survey asking for input and reactions from the public on the proposal. That is fully their right. We have no problem with it, but the, 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 the city was never consulted on that survey. We were never given the heads up on that survey, and we never had a chance to review that survey which then means that, unfortunately, some misinformation got put out. Um, the two main parts of misinformation were there, there has never been a proposal for continuing to put in the future. We, there is no plan for parking meters moving east or west. That was included in a queue up and an introduction to that survey. That's not information that's ever been discussed among staff. Yes, the entire city needs a comprehensive parking management plan but parking meters aren't going to work throughout the city. They, they make sense, we think, on a staff level in the central business district, but in and of themselves, they are not the solution to most of the other parking challenges throughout the city. Um, the other thing that happened with that survey is there was a fee schedule that was taken from the request for proposal that we put out that as talks have progressed among staff and our vendor or potential vendor and our parking consultant, is no longer viable and is no longer under consideration. So the entire preamble for the survey, the thing that was put into people's minds as they thought about parking meters was, was either outdated information that's no longer viable or factually incorrect. Um, and it's just, it's just one of the downfalls of doing the right thing and having meetings like this. Um, 
so the purpose of this working session session and the purpose of doing working sessions in general is really for staff to present to council information that we have ideas that we have for moving forward and then for council to give us their ideas their direction how to tweak it how to make it more palatable and how to make it um, something that the council can get on board with that's the purpose of tonight if we do move forward from tonight um, this would go to a regular council meeting where obviously public input would be sought and welcomed um, that particular next step in this process, should it move forward, uh, would be an agenda item in a future council meeting to authorize the city manager to enter into negotiations and a contract with the potential vendor, in this case, Flowbird. Even after that meeting where public input was solicited uh, and considered and potentially amended again, a plan for parking meters in the central business district is still fluid. It's still not set in stone. There's still plenty of opportunity to massage it and tweak it to get residential input. And then even beyond that, in order to allow parking meters, you need to amend the code in order to create a parking district. Um, that would be involved public hearings, input, again, opportunities to tweak and change. So Although we have a relatively aggressive timeline for wanting to implement this, um, this is really just the beginning of the formal process. Under past administrations, nobody in the public would have even seen this. Um, but because this administration has chosen to be more transparent, it's out there in the public. Um, and there will be, essentially what I'm saying is, uh, I am assuring all of you and the public that there is going to be ample opportunity uh, for, for our residents and our businesses to weigh in on this plan, to help craft it and form it and amend it um, so that we can make sure that this is something that works for everybody. So with all of that said, <laughs> I'm now going to introduce um, or hand it over to our, our parking consultant, uh, Jerry Gioza from Level G Parking. He's going to walk you through the plan. This was done at the last meeting. He's going to make it a little bit briefer this go around um, and then talk to you about uh, what the fiscal impacts um, and fiscal projections are uh, for what is currently on the table and being proposed. And with that, I will lay it quiet. After that, we'll obviously open it up to questions from the council. Thank you, John. Um, before I start to share my screen, I just want to touch on a very important point that John brought up, and that's about what we're about to embark on is a parking management plan and it's all about parking management. And I just wanna talk about two similar situations that have happened over the past decade on Long Island that are very comparable to what we're facing here. Uh, one was in Patchogue and one was in Bayshore. Uh, both of those downtown communities, neither had parking meters and both were, were plagued by, uh, uh, by issues of parking on Main Street, not being able to find a spot, double parking, uh, congestion, circling for spots. Does it sound familiar? Well, both Patchogue and Bayshore implemented parking management plans, which included meters and parking fees to park at those most coveted on-street spaces. Um, Patchogue was implemented, uh, I think about six or seven years ago. Bayshore about three years ago. Uh, both downtowns have, um, have continued to flourish. Um, there has been no, uh, there has been no uh, you know, downturn in terms of the economic activity. In fact, the reverse is true. There's been a, uh, uh, an improvement and uh, uh, increase in investment activity in, in, uh, in both downtowns. Um, but the result has been those meters did change unhealthy parking patterns into healthy parking patterns. Um, the double parkers, the, the the employees, the you know the folks that were uh, that that really wanted to find a spot can now find a spot. There are open spots. There's a heck of a lot less double parking, and a healthy uh, parking uh, patterns have emerged in both communities. And uh, I was involved in uh, both of those parking management plans, and I expect that the same results will occur in, uh, in downtown Long Beach as well. 
So with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen here and uh, get rolling with the uh, with the presentation. And as John said, I'm going to try to roll through the first part um, uh, rather efficiently because we've all seen this before. Uh, and then the last uh, eight slides or so uh, are dealing with um, with our methodology in terms of uh, developing. Uh, revenue projections and and what we think the the net outcomes are going to be for the city um, on an annual basis and over a 10 year period. So the goals and objectives again to promote parking turnover healthy parking patterns as a result of that. A more a more customer friendly parking environment where folks can find a spot to uh, go in and get a slice of pizza or a shop at one of their local shops. Uh, to encourage economic development and provide a funding source to maintain, improve, and beautify and expand the system. Uh, in Patchogue, after the first year of parking revenues, the, uh, the administration there had an eye on a property next to one of their uh, municipal lots. They used the parking revenues to purchase that property and expand the capacity of that lot by 40 spots. So, so the revenue is, you know, can be put back into the system to, again, improve parking, improve the parking situation. So a little bit of a parking meter history. There were meters in, in downtown uh, Long Beach in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I believe they were removed in the 70s over uh, some kind of a, a, a meter scandal. I think someone was um, uh, was stealing uh, some of the you know quarters from the meters and um, and it was uh, from my understanding an overreaction at that time to take them out rather than to deal with the fallout. Um, in 2004, meters were installed at the train station. Uh, the parking meters were proposed in the West End in 2008. That never went forward. Uh, as John mentioned, there was an RFP in 2011 to install 33 meter meters in the CBD, which also did not go forward. And um, the train station parking meters were upgraded in 2012. The current proposal is to institute a parking management plan in the central business district between Lafayette and Monroe, promote parking technology. Today's parking technology is uh, very app driven. So we'd like to promote parking app use uh, as opposed to, um, to using the kiosks, but kiosks will still be available. Uh, and solving the employee parking is also an important part of a fair parking management plan. We have to give employees fair and convenient zones where they can park as well. Uh, so employee parking zones and discounted parking for city residents are also part of this program. Here's the limits of the, uh, the proposed uh, parking management area. As you can see, it's centered on City Hall uh, and going uh, three blocks west to Lafayette, three blocks east down to Monroe, centered on uh, Park Avenue. So the parking sp uh, space classifications, we have transient parking spots, which are paid parking on a first come first serve basis. We have permit parking uh, spaces, which will be designated uh, and or available for a discount for uh, downtown employees and commuters. Free parking, there's going to be free parking for and the handicap stalls as well as short term uh, 10 minute stalls in and out spaces near the post office, city hall uh, and train stations. Uh, transient parking in the current model will be uh, paid parking in effect all days between 9 a.m. and 11 p.m. Uh, the time limits uh, would be in effect between 9 and 5. After 5 p.m., time limits would fall off. This would allow folks going to restaurants and events and so forth to uh, park beyond the posted time limit of, for example, two hours. Uh, the system would be pay by plate using the parking app, or you could use one of 36 meters. Uh, pay by plate is the preferred operation now. Um, where a parker would enter their license plate number uh, to begin a transaction. 
And that also makes enforcement uh, more efficient as now license plate readers can, um, you know, can track whether, uh, whether a parker has paid for parking or not. Again, the city discount um, we're proposing would be that uh, if, the city if the city resident registers in the database, uh, their plate will be posted on the list of, uh, of uh, eligible residents. And when that eligible resident enters their parking space number at the kiosk or on the app, the kiosk or app will automatically apply a 50% a discount uh, to those registered residents. Just by way of comparison, some transient fees at Shore Communities um, are currently running about $3 an hour um, in uh, Point Pleasant, Seaside Heights, Ocean Beach and Rehoboth Beach. Uh, permit parking, the, um, the rules here we're looking at uh, that would be in effect uh, all days between nine and 11 again, uh, and the permits will be digital in nature, just like the transient transactions will be license plate based. If, if I purchase an employee permit or a commuter permit, now my license plate will take the place of a sticker. My license plate will be my permit. So the, the inventory within that zone that, uh, that we identified earlier between, um, uh, between Lafayette and Monroe uh, contains uh, 1,350 spaces. So those 1,350 spaces are what we based our evaluations and analyses upon. And this is the breakdown. We're looking at the majority of those spaces being uh, e-permits and daily parking, close to 500. And then we have various limited spaces, two hour limit, four hour limit, one hour limit, depending on the area of the central business district that they're serving. Enforcement becomes a key element. Um, you know, Really enforcement is an important component of any successful parking management system. And this is so that, um, and this is not to, uh, to generate revenue, this is to ensure compliance with the program. We want folks to go out, purchase their permits. We want folks to get the app and, and pay as they go along. Uh, if, if, a, if a system is not properly enforced, um, folks will quick, quickly learn that they could get away without putting money in the meter and the, the system becomes abused. So uh, with the license plate readers that we're proposing, uh, uh, enforcement becomes very, uh, very efficient. And uh, this particular um, program uh, includes 10 vehicle mounted uh, license plate reader bundles and 40 handheld units. And these, uh, and these enforcement um, units will not be limited to just the parking program. They will be able to enforce other parking regulations throughout the city. So if there's a time if there are time limited spaces in, for example, the West End or Broadway or other areas, uh, these units can be used to enforce those regulations as well in one consolidated system. So now we're becoming more efficient uh, as a program as well. In terms of operation and maintenance. The current structure that we're envisioning with the vendor is that the vendor will operate and maintain the entire system for a period of five years. The city will be responsible for conducting parking enforcement. And we're assuming four in, the, in our financial models, we're assuming four new full-time parking enforcement officer positions to, uh, uh, to administer this program, the enforcement functions of this program and that's so we're not drawing um, uh, we're not drawing uh, uh, folks from other parts of of the parking department of the uh, police department. Yeah, and these are those are what we commonly know as uh, special police officers for the special. Service. Correct. Thank you, John. So, what are we buying in this program? What does the capital program include? Well, it's a it's a robust system. It's a sophisticated system. It's, it's a system that in a way we're fortunate because 
we have kind of a blank slate to work with. And as a result, we're not trying to, um, you know, retrofit certain portions of this. Uh, we have uh, we have one of the, you know, one of the country's top vendors in these systems uh, on board with us, uh, and they are able to, and they have proven uh, in other uh, areas and other uh, communities where they have pulled these systems together. And you'll see it's quite uh, it's quite comprehensive. Thirty six multi-space meter, meter kiosks, 10 LPR bundles that'll be mounted on uh, the police vehicles. Uh, again, inside each vehicle, a Panasonic Toughbook and ticket riders. Two new Ford Interceptor vehicles to, um, to add to the fleet. 40 handheld ticket riders. The perimeter egress program with the license plate readers will be finalized. Right now, it's only partially partially implemented. That would be, uh, we would need nine additional lanes to finalize that program. So nine additional perimeter fixed LPR egress. A civil package including signage and footings, uh, a digital parking permit system where we will be able to uh, administer all the permits in a, uh, in a dashboard situation, a hosted situation. This would not be hosted by, by the city on, on servers owned by the city. This would be all be cloud-based, hosted by the vendor. Pay by app, citation management. After a ticket is written, it will become part of the system. It will be downloaded and tracked um, on a thorough basis. Uh, and we could do searches of, of plates and, um, and, and track every citation that is written. Through the courts, there's an appeals process as well, uh, where, where folks will be able to appeal their citations online if they so desire. Find collection services for, for, uh, for uh, citations that, uh, that go unpaid. The vendor would also be providing that. All the merchant processing, the credit card fees, a 24 seven call center. And that's for customers who are having difficulty with the meters or with the app. They could call at any time, and that's also provided in this package. Um, the 24-7 call center would also apply to the town, if uh, I'm sorry, to the city. If the city were having difficulties with the software or with, um, you know, with the back office function or the dashboard, they would be able to call uh, this, this, you know, a special call center as well. All this would be tied together, all the hardware, software, and communications are supplied as part of this package. The back office, the dashboard, where all of this can be monitored by, um, by city personnel with permissions. So if you want certain uh, personnel to only have access to certain portions of, of the data that's collected, and there's a lot of data here that's going to be, um, that's going to be collected, uh, we can do that through permissions. And finally, a turnkey delivery of the entire system, fully integrated, tested, and operational. So, so you can see where, you know, starting kind of from scratch is, is going to give us an advantage here that the vendor will be able to pull all this together without having existing components and parts to, you know, to play with or try to integrate um, into some kind of clunky integration. This is, this is going to be uh, kind of a, a fully functioning integrated system and um, and that's what the capital program includes. So the contract structure, we're looking at two structures right now. We've run numbers for a structure which is vendor financed with a revenue share or city financed with uh, with new debt. So um, of course the vendor financed, the vendor would um, you know would install the entire system and would be paid back over time from the revenues generated by the system. The city finance system would, would, the city would have to be issuing new debt and would purchase the system outright uh, at the onset, but then would be responsible for the operation and maintenance of the system uh, from day one. So implementation, um, you know, we, we still need to finalize negotiations and develop a contract with, with our vendor. Uh, as John mentioned, we'll need enabling legislation and ordinances. 
uh, marketing, education, public and, and public awareness in terms of the system, what it means, how it works, what the options are for, uh, for payment systems, for the app, for businesses to participate in terms of uh, validations and so forth. Um, of course, we would have to install, integrate, and test all these systems. Uh, and, you know, we're hoping for a go live date in the uh, summer, uh, this summer. Uh, we do have a Memorial Day, we did have a Memorial Day target, which, um, you know, which is, I guess, still on the table, but which we feel of uh, the distance we still need to travel is, is, is a fairly aggressive target. So now we're going to get into the financial pro uh, projections. And I'm going to start off with, uh, with, with the, the foundation of how the financial projections were developed. And this was done from counts. And back when we were engaged in 2018, uh, we conducted uh, counts in the central business district in the 1,350 spaces uh, between 9 a.m. and 11 p.m. The counts actually extended further. They started at, at 8 and went to midnight. Uh, but because the 9 to 11 period is the, is the revenue generating period that we're looking at, uh, that's what this graph is representing. So at 9 a.m., what this is showing is that on Tuesday, October 23rd, 2018, there were 900 cars parked in those 1,350 spaces. As the day progressed, you could see the number of cars started to pick up until it hit a peak of 1,100 um, here. And uh, the Tuesday is the blue line, so 1,100. Uh, peak at 1 p.m. And then it started to drop down uh, throughout the day until at 11 p.m. there were 410. Now on a Friday, Friday has a different pattern. Friday is the old double hump camel here. Uh, after five o'clock, folks go home from work, the downtown gets a second life. Restaurants uh, come alive and uh, folks start coming into town. So you can see that the Friday curve is, uh, is, is uh, definitely different from the, the Tuesday curve. So you can see on Friday, we hit a peak of here, uh, 1220 at 1 p.m. Uh, and then we had a second, secondary peak uh, here in the p.m. period of, an, of, another, of about 1,000 cars. And in terms of using this volume to project revenue, uh, every, every hour by hour, and you know, you, we are gauging parking on an hourly basis. So you look at a parking rate of $1 an hour or $2 an hour. Basically the area under these curves is the revenue. So, um, so taking these uh, utilization hours or paid hours, and then bringing them into our financial models using different parking rates, uh, gives us our parking projections after some adjustments are made, and I'll, I'll discuss that in a little bit. But I want to call your attention to these utilization hours here sh shaded in yellow. On the Tuesday, we had 12,985, and on the Friday, the total, the total utilization hours was 14,715. And those are basically just a summation of the hourly totals on each hour of the day. So now we go to our first um, financial projection and we're looking here at a seasonal rate of $2 an hour and then rates in the shoulder season and off season of $1 an hour. Now the, 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 hour, the peak season is estimated to be basically Memorial Day to Labor Day. So, so June, July, and August. So those three months, the parking rate in the CBD would be $2 an hour. In all other months, it would be $1 an hour. And Long Beach residents in this model are given a 50% discount. So during peak season, uh, for those three months, the residents would be paying $1 an hour. And in the shoulder season and off season, 50 cents an hour. So now you can see highlighted in yellow here are we've imported our utilization hours and because those counts were done in October, that's a shoulder season. So our first one was a Tuesday count. 
So because each day of the week has a different um, pattern for parking, we broke out uh, for each of the three seasons, uh, Monday through Thursday, Friday and Saturday, and a Sunday. Each has its own kind of unique parking pattern. So in the shoulder seasons, there's a total of 105 days out of 365. And we believe that the average utilization is gonna be about 1,295 um, utilization hours per day on those 105 days. And then if we use, we're in the shoulder season at a dollar an hour, um, multiplied by the number of days, 105, that would yield about a million three in revenue for that, for that year. Uh, in the, uh, in the South Friday and Saturday, it was 1475. That calculation yields a different number. Now in the peak season, we're assuming that, um, uh, that the, that peak season utilization is 15% higher than the sh shoulder seasons. So these are adjusted entries here, but all based on the, on, on the base counts uh, done in October. So these numbers are generally 15% higher than the October counts. And those numbers are indicated here for the, uh, for the 52 weekdays, the 26 Friday and Saturdays and the 13 Sundays in the peak season. And in the off season at a dollar an hour, we're assuming that these, um, that these revenues are generally 25% uh, lower than the shoulder seasons. And that's what's reflected here. And these are the expected outcomes in terms of revenue. So you add all that up, it comes to 5.9 million. However, because the counts were globally done, including all cars parked in all spots, we have to make some adjustments. So the first adjustment is to account for the permit parkers parked in these spots, mostly the employee permits. So we're assuming that about 32% of those cars uh, that were counted are going to be employee cars who are purchasing permits to park rather than putting money in the meters or the kiosks. So we have to make an adjustment. We have to pull out revenue, works out to be about 1.9 in this model um, from that revenue stream to account for the employee cars. And also because the Long Beach residents are not, will not be paying the full freight, they'll be only paying 50%, we have to make another adjustment. So we're assuming that 27.5% of those cars counted in this model are going to be Long Beach resident cars. So we make another adjustment. So the final uh, uh, estimated revenue from this model is about 3.48 million per year. That's at $2 and $1 for the, uh, for, the, for the rates. We then went and did this same exercise at a second rate structure of $3 an hour um, and $1.50. And this is the model that is, um, is more consistent with, uh, with the shore communities that, um, that I indicated earlier. So this is kind of in the middle. So we did, we did one below the shore community models, one at the shore community models, and then the next one is a one is dollar above the shore communities. So, uh, so if, we, if we went to the $3 in the off season and dollar fit, I'm sorry, $3, in peak season and $1.50 in the off season, using the same utilization, uh, our annual revenue would increase to about 5.2 million. And going to, uh, to the most aggressive model at $4 an hour and the shoulder season and off seasons at $2 an hour, uh, the annual revenue would be close to 7 million a year. So then what we did is we took these projections and we pro forma them out over a 10 year period. Now, 10 year period was selected because we believe that that's the life, the useful life of the meters and of the technology as well uh, that, we'll be, that we'd be purchasing in this initial package. So we're confident that, that this capital program is gonna take us through a 10 year period, but at that, 
at that time, we're probably going to have to retool uh, at least um, you know, part of the system. So, uh, so we thought that the 10 year period uh, would be a good, uh, a good comparison period. So here's, the, here's just an example. I'm not gonna go through every number here, uh, but I just wanna give you an example of the pro formas and how they were developed. Uh, the top part, we have all the parameters that were used, the hours of operation, uh, the rates. You know, this, is, this particular one is at $4 an hour. Uh, in the peak season and two dollars an hour in the off peak. There's a there's a daily parking rate of twenty five dollars a day. Um, there is uh, the Long Beach resident vehicle registration fees are put in the employee parking permits, uh, the overtime parking violations, and uh, and all the revenue items are listed up here in the uh, in the top five lines. Um, then in the revenue share model, the vendor has, has proposed a system where, where the first $3.8 million that is collected in a certain fashion will go to the vendor for him, for him to recapture all of the capital costs and operating expenses and developmental expenses that they outlaid to get our system up and running. So these, these numbers in the gray boxes here are numbers that are basically repaying the vendor for, for financing our system. And in this model, for the, um, for, at the $4 an hour at the most aggressive rate, the vendor would be paid back that first 3.8 million and I've estimated to be about 13 to 14 months. After that, there is some uh, there, there continues to be some revenue sharing, but not at the, uh, not at the initial rate, uh, more at a, at a rate that's much more favorable to the city. Um, and, and the vendor will, will participate in revenue sharing for a five-year period. Um, and then, so these are the operating expenses that we're looking at that have all been accounted for. Communications, all the cellular communications required between all the Equipment, uh, an administrator who will be who oversee the operation, uh, the system maintenance, all the merchant processing and bank fees, other miscellaneous costs uh, are all accounted for. Then, after the vendor um, has uh, has been uh, paid that first uh, investment, the operating expenses would flip over to the city although the vendor would continue to operate the system through that five-year period. So again, communications, parking operations administrator, uh, merchant processing, and the parking enforcement officers are listed down here in line 21. The city pays this expense from year one through year 10 because the city will see 100% of the enforcement revenue. So the enforcement revenue is indicated here projected on line 15. So the enforcement revenue is not shared in this model. The enforcement revenue goes 100% to the city. So, uh, so as a result of this model, we have uh, projected five-year in, uh, five income to the vendor and a 10-year income to the city uh, over the entire course of this model. Uh, and then we did the same thing for the bond financing model. So we're assuming here now that the city will, uh, will, will float a 10 year bond uh, at what, you know, the most competitive rate that we could find uh, and will be, will purchase the system outright upfront. So now as a result of this, um, you know, the, the, the pros are, the city will not will be recovering basically 100% of all the revenues, but at the same time, will be responsible for operating the system and maintaining the system from year one through year 10. One of the benefits of the revenue share is that the, the vendor will be operating and maintaining the system for the first five years and will be working, it'll be a system of working out the, any bugs or kinks that uh, might be encountered and we'll be delivering, uh, you know, a, a fully functioning system, and then there will be a, uh, you know, an easy transition uh, after that five-year period. So, uh, so now the same, uh, 
um, revenues to the city are calculated using this model. And, uh, and they're a little more uh, you know, beneficial to the city because obviously there's, there's no revenue sharing and the develop and the, the vendor is not recuperating his financing costs and developmental costs and so forth. So to summarize what, what these pro formas yielded in terms of, uh, of revenues, net revenues after expenses have been pulled out, is summarized on this chart. So the so the A rate structure was four dollars an hour during the peak and two dollars an hour in the off season. The ten year net income and this after expenses to the city is estimated to be sixty four million. At three dollars an hour and a dollar fifty, it would be forty eight million point four, and at the first um, rate structure, the two dollars an hour in the peak season and dollar all other times, 32 million 476. Those are our projections for the structure that is bond financing by the city. And again, the pros, a higher 10 year yield to the city. Uh, the cons are that um, it will add to the city's outstanding debt balance and that operating and maintenance responsibilities will shift to the city. In the Revenue share structure, which we're calling a P3, which is public private partnership uh, structure. And the vendor will become our partner in this because you know the vendor wants to see this the program succeed. The city wants to be the see the program succeed. The, the model is structured in such a fashion that um, that it's in the interest of both parties for the program to be successful. And uh, by all indications, it'll be quite successful. Um, in these models, the five-year net income to the vendor uh, in the $4, $2 scenario would be just under $6 million. In the $3, $1.50 scenario, about $5.3 million. And in the $2, $1 scenario, about $4.8 million. The 10-year net income to the city you'll see is slightly, is somewhat lower than, um, than if we did a bond financing structure, uh, six, so, but it would still be significant, 61 million uh, in structure A, 45 million in structure B, and 30 million and 30.4 million in structure C. So that is the, the summary of, um, of the financial projections. And with that, I guess I will turn it over to you know, either back to John to uh, clean up, do a little cleanup, and then uh, to the council for any questions. I, I think the only clarity on this that I would ask uh, of you, Jerry, is what do you define as the shoulder season here in these projections? Okay, the, the shoulder season, the, the peak season is June, July, and August or Memorial Day to Labor Day. The off-peak season is December, January, and February. The shoulder seasons are September, October, November, April, and May. Okay. Thank you for that clarity. And with that, I would hand it over to uh, City Council President McGinnis to uh, field questions from both herself and the rest of the council. Um, thank you, uh, John and Jerry, for the uh, presentation. It's very clear. Um, you know, now we'll start questions from the council. I think, uh, in fairness to everyone, I think you know you should have uh, one or two questions, and then we'll rotate to the next council person so that everyone gets a turn. Um, I'm going to start with my uh, first two questions. Um, in terms of the kiosks, um, I was actually in Rockville Center this morning and uh, put my card in the meter to pay. And um, it was a little bit hard to read uh, the machine. So um, I was wondering if there's any sort of improvements since then, and also very concerned about um, weather um, affecting the machines down here. So I would, um, Jerry, if you wouldn't mind, uh, stop sharing your screen at this stage of the game. We can come back to it if we need it for a frame of reference. But I would, I would hand that over to either, um, well, to either Ed or Sean. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ed Kincaid. I do business development for, for Flowbird. Thank you very much for having me. 
Uh, the Rock Fill Center is a older product with the monochrome screen that is smaller. Our proposal here is a 9.7 inch color touch display, uh, much more user friendly, much easier to interface with. Um, as far as weather is concerned, we are at Beach Towns, um, well, we're all across Long Island, but at Beach Towns from Maine down to Florida and up and down the West Coast as well, we have no issues as far as weather is concerned. Uh, whether that be the summer heat, the humidity, the cold, um, as well as the, you know, the salt water and the salt air. And then my, my, my follow-up question. Thank you, um, Ed. Um, in terms of uh, in installing the uh, kiosks, so when you're digging up and making um, electric hookups, is that all included in the installation price? The kiosks are, are solar powered. Um, okay, that's great. So, yep, so that, that minimizes any infrastructure needs. Okay, so let's I'm going to keep this moving. Uh, next council member who would like to go next with uh, one or two questions so we can rotate. Well, I would just, if you don't, if you don't mind, um, mm -hmm. one of the questions that had come up from staff level, and I'm sure would come up for either council or members of the public, we have the, the south side of Park Avenue, rarely sees uh, sun. So could you expound upon, Ed, how, how the units function in that environment? Yeah, absolutely. So some of you may be familiar with us uh, from New York City. We're the vendor that has done New York City for the past uh, 30 years. So we are accustomed to tall buildings, to overhanging trees. Um, the solar panels are 13 watt solar panels. They actually produce about 15 watts worth of energy. It's a drip charge unit. So the, the units are actually battery driven and drip charged 24 seven. Any ambient light that is generated in those shadows from the you know, tall buildings or, or overhanging trees, continues to charge it. Battery life uh, on, on these kiosks is spec for three to five years. And in all honesty, it's not unusual to get a sixth year, even a seventh year out of those batteries. Now, of course, you'll have a few that are on the shorter end of that range, but three to five years is the specified battery life. Thanks, Ed. Back to you, Karen. Okay. Um, who would like to... Uh, does anyone want to go next with their question? John? All right, I guess I'll go. Uh, I already got my, one of my questions asked about when was peak, off peak, and shoulder. Um, for the, for the uh, vendor proposed model, in, in years um, six through 10, so that's after the capital recovery period, I guess the, uh, the revenue sharing period, the city expenses for uh, for the system is that the city paying the vendor under a service contract? Is it uh, hourly rates, flat rates, uh, or is it the city's hiring staff to do it themselves? Ourselves? How, how does that work? That that that's an excellent question. Um, what I assumed is that. Um, in this model, we've taken the vendor rates that they um, that they set forth in their proposal, and we added 10%. So that if we would we figured that if we did bring the vendor on as the operator after year five, um, there would be at least a 10 there would be probably a 10% markup on what their uh, on what their being uh, on what their expenses are at that time. Uh, it could also be a hybrid. They could be they could be engaged for some functions, and the city might be able to take on some other functions. But in general, uh, the vendor can operate the system uh, more economically than than we can as a public entity. So there is there is a bump up in expenses uh, in year six that have been accounted for in the models. All right. So then. As part of that, it, uh, let's say in the first five years where th the vendor is responsible for the system, um, if something happens, equipment needs to be replaced, uh, you know, uh, obviously things break. Is that part of that uh, revenue sharing, I guess, uh, their part of maintaining the system? Or if it, it, uh, could there be potentially additional costs if if equipment needs to be replaced, uh, new software, uh, whatever the case may be. Yeah, uh, during the capital recovery period, the vendor is 100% responsible 
for all those you know equipment replacements and upgrades and so forth. But um, but beyond that, that becomes the responsibility of the city. Okay, so if a meter the peters the out, vendor, is... the vendor will execute those through year five. Right. But the but the city will be responsible for. Okay, so if a, if if a kiosk needed to be replaced in year seven, that would be then be the city's responsibility. That's that that's expense. Correct. But but okay. there are but the service contract and Ed, correct me if I'm wrong. Service contract that was um, that was quoted in here was a, a high level service contract that would, you know, there would be automatic upgrades and um, you know replacements of equipment that uh, were that became outdated. Correct, and any defective parts there, Jerry, are, are going to be covered. I think it's important to note for the council that all of the parts inside this meter are modular and plug and play, uh, which makes for the easy fix the easy replacement or the quick upgrade um, of any unanticipated technologies there. It really makes for an efficient, relatively future-proof system over that 10 years that, that Jerry discussed, and I would even argue 10 plus. All right, and I guess if I could just, uh, Karen, I'll ask one more then. Wait, wait, Ron's got his finger up. Yeah, I just want to point something out too that I think is important to remind everybody of. Zero negotiations have taken place at this point. This is just a proposal that's come from the vendor and us discussing it. Some of the uh, some of the negotiations are going to surround exactly the questions that you're asking, John. You know okay. how how we how we structure maintenance, how we structure replacement, how long they're willing to work work with us within the structure because they're making money on this too within that structure to you know extend our the warranty on product. All that stuff is part of negotiation that has not taken place at all yet. Okay, okay. thanks, Ron. Mm -hmm. And I guess just one more. Uh, this is something I, I know it's happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to others. Uh, you go up to one of these uh, uh, kiosks somewhere, and the kiosk is out of order. Um, I've I've found this particularly true around the off the Nassau County office buildings. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and I've, I've seen this in other places. I was uh, uh, down in Florida not long ago, had something similar happen there. Um, uh, so uh, I believe there was talk in the first presentation that I guess the, the, the company gets a, a, a message if a piece of equipment goes down through, through you know, onboard sensors and stuff. But uh, in the interim, if a piece of equipment is down and you got people standing at a kiosk, or trying to figure out how to pay for their spot and they're unable to, uh, what, so, what happens? What's so, I, I think I got you, Just. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, Ed, could you talk about your side of things? And then I think Commissioner Walsh talk about, I mean, one, one important thing to note is we're looking at a hybrid system here where the, the physical you know, multimeter in front of you, if that is down, there will still be an option to pay for your parking on a mobile app. Um, but somebody I understand might, that, but not everyone might not use an app. Somebody might not get that. Right. So Ed, if you could, if you could speak to, or Sean, whoever it would be on your side, um, talk to how that's handled on your end. And then if we could just pitch that to commissioner Walsh quickly to talk about what the law enforcement reaction would be if somebody was in a position where they were actually unable to quote unquote feed the meter. Thank you, John. Um, overwhelmingly, with the majority of our clients, we are not <clears throat> the operator or responsible for the upkeep and maintenance of the equipment. Uh, that's kind of what is unique about this conversation that we're having here today is this is going to is a, a new venture that we're taking on as a company. And, and, and we're excited about this opportunity here in Long Beach. Um, so I can't speak to Nassau County. You might have saw I laughed a little bit that uh, Nassau County is uh, unique. As, as, as a client, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, but, you know, it's incumbent upon us, you know, to keep the meters up and running. There are alarms that are issued by text and email to our technicians and any city officials who opt into that, um, as well as back office alarms and visual alarms at the meter. Uh, clients have the option to pay at any meter uh, throughout the city of Long Beach. And of course the app is there's a backup. So there is redundancy. Um, if one mode of payment is not the offline on the meter, the redundancy is the meter will tell you, hey, I'm only taking coins or I'm only taking credit cards. And it, it will communicate to the user, um, you know, if there's a problem with one of the modes of payment that it's no longer taking that option. 
Okay. You wanted me to uh, talk about the law enforcement side of that, John, real quick? So, uh, uh, if you could, so because you know, I, I guess we just have to recognize that it's probably a reality that at some point, uh, you know, a piece of equipment's going to become an operative for some period of time. And inside yeah. the maintenance agreement, we had discussions with the flow bird also about their response time and the monitoring of the equipment. So, that's something that we talked about how quickly they come out and fix it. Also, the direction to go to other meters would be also available. And we would also know internally and be able to produce in court if someone come up and says, hey, the meter's not working, that information is readily available inside the system for us to say, nope, all the meters are working on this day. Here's the report, introduce that, which then would turn into, uh, sorry, the meter was working. You're just trying to get out of uh, paying your fine. So there's a lot of backups to this thing too. So uh, it was a lot of it was uh, thought of it. Thought of. Great. Okay. Um, and any other council members just to keep the rotation going? Yeah. I, I yeah, do. go ahead, Roy. Go, 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 I, no, no, Tina, Tina, go ahead. Okay, oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I only have a couple here. Um, going back to the original presentation, I flagged this the last time, but then didn't get to ask it. Can someone just ex um, clarify for me the time limit uh, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., that, that definition? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the rationale with it, and this is something that, you know, we're looking for direction from council on, but 9 a.m., we wanted, we wanted Long Beach residents to be able to, you know, stop at Bagel Cafe or, you know, wherever and be able to get their early morning, you know, activities taken care of as they head off to work. Um, without having to feed the meters. And then the latter part of the day going to 11 o'clock, that's where we believe um, a large part of the non-resident revenue generation will come from. Folks that are coming into town uh, to go to a restaurant, to go to our local, you know, our local establishments for, for dinner or drinks. Um, that's where a lot of the non-resident revenue comes from after those hours. Um, there is obviously precedent for some communities, Rockville Center stopped at six. Um, I spoke with them today, actually, and that was largely done because individuals, they didn't have the technology at the time when they pushed it to six o'clock from what was previously nine o'clock. Folks were having to leave a movie theater to go out to feed the meters because they couldn't refill it. Um, they on, the only way to do it was manually. So now with the app, that's no longer as much of an issue. Um, you know, we do have a lot of towns stop it at six. For us, we think that's going to eliminate a large portion of non-resident revenue. Um, but you do have examples of Patchogue has their meters on till 4 a.m. Uh, Port Jefferson has them on till, till midnight. Um, so there are other ones out there that go even beyond um, what, what we've proposed here. Okay, yeah, but you know, when we were defining the 9 a.m. to 11 p.m., and then under that, it says time limit 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., does that mean there's there's certain accommodations in between that window? Is that kind of- So yeah, I mean, what it is, there's, there's time limits, there's certain spots that we're talking about. Curbside, we're talking about two hours strict. Okay. So after 5 p.m., you could potentially lose that two hour time constraint, okay. be able to stay there for four hours. Okay. Um, same thing for other areas where there might be given time constraints. Gotcha. Thank to, you. To, to avoid exactly what John was talking about, someone having to run out to their car because they're they're running up against a two hour limit. The two hour limit would 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 drop off after five p.m. So that if I'm at a movie or if I'm at a dinner enjoying uh, dessert, I won't have to run out to uh, to feed the meter. I could purchase um, you know my full amount of time, maybe an extra hour. Um, up front and not have to worry about running out to feed the meter. Okay, okay thank you. Um, and then just on the P3 rate structure there, uh, there was a underneath it said um, that that would re require close monitoring. And now is that something, you know, should that be something we would look into uh, that could be handled by current staff and what would be needed to ensure accurate um, calculations there when it says careful monitoring. So, so, the, so the back office function, every, every meter, every nickel that's put into to every meter, every credit card transaction 
every app transaction is detailed uh, in the back office. And it's an open book for the city and for the vendor. But in terms of the monitoring of same, uh, we have to keep track of the accumulation of revenue so that once that once the revenue, once the, the vendor has recaptured his initial investment, then the structure kind of changes from that point through year five. So that's the only reason we, it's, it's basically saying we have to keep our eye on the ball in terms of accounting um, to, uh, to, to properly, um, you know, work through the financial structure here. Okay. So, and, it, so and it's, it's easily, it's easily accomplished given the, the back office and the transparency of the, of the data. But when, you know, you know, back office is really, you know, it's a lot of data. And um, if we have staff that are already working 150%, then where does the, that back office personnel come from? Like, how is that accounted for? Like, wouldn't it be a half a head count from one department, like Enos department and another full half a head count from Ron's department? Like, where is that the cost accounted for? Uh, I, I think the data can be easily um, manipulated and filtered so that um, we could receive uh, weekly or bi-weekly reports in terms of what the revenue is, monthly reports. Um, you know, it, it's, it's easily tracked, but has to be monitored in order to... President McGinnis, I think uh, a little bit more direct to what you're asking. Uh, inside this particular model, there is no backroom staff that's built into managing this because we left that up to the vendor. Uh, if we were to switch ourselves at some point in time to a model like that, you would then take into the TE that you would need, full-time equivalent, that you might need for a position to do this, comptroller's office or wherever, and then take that revenue from the actual program to pay for that person's salary and account for it that way. So that would be part of your net calculation as you know, taking it out of the gross so that you pay your net calculation would change by additional staff and reducing the expenses of the vendor. My personal recommendation dealing with these things in the county is I wouldn't recommend that for the beginning. I would recommend that in, as a long-term view uh, for something that you might want to consider after we understand how, to, how this thing works. I would recommend staying with the vendor for at least a minimum of five years. Right, so if so, that means in both the vendor proposed and the bond financing structure, somewhere between line six, you know, somewhere in the proposals, there should be a line item for a potential city cost yeah. on identity TBD of X amount of dollars, right? Jerry, you can speak to that. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I don't think it would be. You know, we're not talking about a full time position here. It's it, it's basically somebody to review a report and see how much revenue the the vendor has accumulated on a month by month basis to keep track of it. And then once they hit that number, then we've then we enter phase two of the agreement. So it's it, it's somebody reviewing a report that's automatically generated by the system. Uh, on a monthly basis, I, I I I see it as maybe you know a few hours a month. Go ahead, Ina. And from operating standpoint, um, we can just open up a separate bank account to to feed all this revenue, so it will be segregated and more easily tracked. Okay, um, okay. For sake of time, thank you, um, Roy. Did you have some questions? Oh, uh, seriously, <laughs> yeah. About a thousand. I'll start with uh, just a couple, give other people a chance. Uh, what is the inter intervals of time that people can buy at these meters? Right, here. Uh, right now, it's, uh, it's it, you know, if it, I believe you could still put in a nickel and purchase, you know, six and a half minutes or whatever it works out in the rate structure. So if you, you, don't, you don't have to purchase a full hour, that's not the minimum. You could purchase, you know, you could still, the meters will still accept nickels, dimes. Uh, so you can, you know, purchase, you can have a short stay of six minutes or 12 minutes or whatever you decide to, uh, to purchase. And that'll be available with the credit cards too? 
Uh, unfortunately, I, I think the credit card purchase is, has to be a dollar minimum. Yeah, and there's there's credit card. I mean, with the app, to be perfectly upfront, there is there's like a convenience fee with the app too. So it's going to tack on another 30, 35 cents for it. So, you know, if you're looking at, uh, you know, if, if you're if we're looking at the the four dollar two dollar structure, you're doing a two dollar for an hour, and there's going to be a thirty or thirty five percent surcharge um, for that initial purchase on on cents, the app. Not, not percent cents. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Thirty-five cents. So if you buy, if you get a dollar's worth of time, you're paying a dollar thirty-five. If you use the app, mm -hmm. that's a vendor. If fee. you, yeah, okay. Um, now the the, uh, the vendor at this point gets seventy percent of the first up until a certain amount each year. I think three point eight million or something. Is that right, Jerry? 70. But so if we took in, if the vendor came in and put all the equipment in and everything, and we only took in a thousand dollars, I know it's, you know, unrealistic, but let's say the vendor only gets 70% of that thousand. In other words, the max he can get is 70%. It's not a, you know, he, he can't recoup his money first. It, it just the capital recovery period would would it would would drag on if if, if okay but it is we would we are guaranteed thirty percent no matter what correct during that okay period. that's that's what I'm asking about okay now I'm trying to figure out how we came up with these numbers for the uh, utilization hours per day for our meters. Now, are we talking about, we, we had certain meters here, you know, two hour meters, we had uh, 397 four hour meters, we had 319, 30 minutes, 42, et cetera. The permit spaces, the permit spaces do not have meters. Uh, the 497 permit spaces. Well, they, they would be metered, but they could, but if you have a permit, you don't have to put money in the meter. So you you can only use those spaces if you have a permit. No, they're they're if if it's if the if the car is is not if the space is not filled with a car that has a permit plate, anyone could could park in it. Yeah, well, what, what okay. we're contemplating is a first come first serve. So that might be designated as a priority parking for this is where an employee can park, but if a customer gets to it first, the customer is there. And the customers well, there. Then, then could you explain to me what you mean by a permit space? Well, I mean, somebody, well, for somebody example, buys a, The yeah. permit spaces will be in the center malls. In other words, we, yes. the permit spaces are not going to be the, the prime spaces uh, in front of the stores along those curves. Those spaces we want for the customers, those are the turnover spaces. So the employee, uh, the employees who receive permits are only going to be permitted to park in the center malls and on certain spaces on the side streets, not along the main drag on park. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you're counting those permit spaces. Well, on one hand, you're saying that they're part of the hourly, what you expect utilization in an hour per day, and then, <clears throat> then you minus 32% for the permits. The permits are 37%, but you minus 32%. Is that correct? Uh, out, of, out of, yes, oh, Jerry. Yes, yes, because, because there, would, there would be, in, 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 the, in the inventory model, there are 497 possible spaces that we might designate um, as permit spaces, but we're, we're, we're projecting a lower number of permits to actually be utilized. Okay, so if somebody comes along and they they grab a permit space, a regular client, you know, a regular uh, person, let's say out of town, and they grab a permit space, they're not limited to the two hours, four hours. They whatever they pay for, they can stay until correct. Correct. If it's yeah. if it if it's a daily space where they could park up to twelve hours, they could purchase up to twelve hours. 
Uh, Jerry, Jerry, wait, 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 wait. I think uh, it's Roy. Am I correct that you asked if someone took up permit space? Yes. There is no designated. There is a permit space is a certain area which can go to a permit car or a non permitted car. Correct. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. And I'm asking if a non permit car goes there, mm -hmm. he has to pay, they have to pay money. Now, that right. space is not limited to two hours or four hours or 30 minutes or anything like that. It is. So it, it is. is. No, uh, it, wait, it, the they, they will be, they will have, they, they could park up to 12 hours in most of those permit spaces. So, if they don't are, have so a, it's not, it's not but limited. If they don't have a permit, then they then they have to abide by the two hour, four hour rules, right, Jerry? Well, well, what happens is, you know, you do have uh, temporary employees or someone that might only be coming in for, uh, you know, a catering event or something and needs to park all day, but doesn't but doesn't want to have to purchase a permit just for that. So we want to have some spots available for people who need to park for more than four hours. So there are gonna be spaces where there's, where you can purchase up to 12 hours of parking. If for example, I'm a temporary employee or, or, or a part-time employee. So I'm not talking those, about those, those Jerry. spaces would be, would be the same spaces that the permit holders would be allowed to park in. Jerry, I'm right. talking about a regular person that comes here and he goes to a permit mm -hmm. spot you have 497 permit spots. So someone comes here, he goes to a permit spot, he's paying the fee, okay? He's paying the dollar an hour, $2 an hour, $4 an hour, whatever it is. He's limited, he's not even limited because it, it's 12 hours, but it goes beyond 12 hours. I mean, past the 12 hours, the meat is not in effect. So so Roy, I mean, my what I would say is, I mean, A, it's, probably not a very realistic scenario we're talking about it's a very small subset of of any any scenario that we're talking about as far as you john john i'm asking if it's possible it's, I'm not it's asking possible. who's going to do it so it's possible yeah. it's not likely and it's certainly not economical for that individual um but that's also why you know as we've stated in the past any parking system like this is a living breathing system so we are going to be not just the beginning of this until it hits the ground running, but this is going to be something that is constantly amended and tweaked as we start to get the real life data. Back right. Too. John, so, the purpose of this is to ask the question. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm asking the questions. I'm, saying, I'm not asking whether it's going to be possible, whether someone's going to do it. I'm trying to figure out the structure. Yep. And that's 100%. why I was asking about the permit, the 497 spots. They're not necessarily just permit people. They could be for anybody. Okay, Correct. Karen, you want to let someone else ask questions? I have more questions, but I don't want to take up the time. Sure. Um, Liz, you haven't asked, do you have any questions? I have questions, but in, uh, I know Roy has a hard stop, so I would... Uh, no, that's all right, Liz. Liz I please. yield to you, Go Roy, ahead. please. Go ahead. Finish it up. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how we came up with the numbers of uh, the estimated average utilization per day of all these spots. And, um, you know, I, I'm looking at the, the Great Neck Plaza, what they charge, how many uh, hours they use. Uh, Great Neck charges 50 cents an hour. They, the revenue, let's say they, the revenue is 70,000 uh, annually from 750 metered spots. John, that's what you sent me today. Is that correct? That okay. is correct. That, 70 that, is the very high end of their estimate of what they make. Right. Yeah. Right. So that comes out to 186 hours per year, per year. Okay. For their 700 metered spots. Um, the Huntington has 500 metered spots, charge a dollar an hour. The revenue is 700,000. That comes out to 3.8 hours a day. I think they're reporting net numbers, though. They're not reporting gross numbers. Those are net. Right. That's they're all expenses and all back room. So that's not the number of hours. That's the number of 
how much money they're actually clearing. Well, it says revenue. It, it didn't say net revenue. It said the revenue. And I assume revenue is the, what comes actually in. It, it should I, have I, been net. You, My apologies. So we don't know what they gross. I can, I can do further inquiries with all of them. And I still have other well, municipalities I'm talking to as well. Okay, because I, I'm looking and I, I, you know, to me, these numbers were based on numbers of two days back in 2018, uh, October 23rd and October 26th. At that time, there were no meters, there was no incentive for anybody to move. So somebody parked and they're going to park there probably the entire day. But based on that, the numbers are that that meter was utilized for the, you know, up until 11 o'clock. I think we stopped counting. Oh, no, you actually, Jerry, you said we stopped counting at 12 o'clock, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, to base our possible utilization on numbers that were taken when there was absolutely no incentive to move, I, I, I you know, so, to me, it's suspect. Okay, so so what, what we did in our models is uh, you'll see the, on the right-hand column of those um, projections, we in parentheses, it says year three. So you're correct. There is a, um, there, there is a, a change in patterns immediately following the implementation of such a system. In year one, we're project, so year three, we consider quote unquote, mature revenue. So that is a regulated system where people will come back to their normal parking habits, which were measured back in October, 2018. In, in year one, we're projecting 64% of mature revenue is going to be realized. In year two, we think the ramp is gonna to start to increase a little bit more. 84% of the mature revenue number is estimated in year two. And then by year three, people have gotten tired of, you know, uh, carpooling and doing other things to, you know, try to save their, um, you know, uh, you know, a parking fee here and there, and have regulated back to their normal parking habits. And that's that's a, a pattern that uh, that I've seen repeatedly uh, over the years um, historically in um, in downtowns across the Northeast. And, and I'll just say, I'm not, I'm not here to fluff Jerry, but I've spoken to a number of the municipalities that he has been the lead consultant in implementing new systems. Um, I'm well aware that, you know, past performance is not a guarantee of future success, but um, in, in all three of the ones that I've spoken to on Long Island, where, where he has performed the role he's performing here, um, the revenue has exceeded um, the projections that, that he put out. So I think he's, He's got a history of being pretty conservative and pretty spot on. We're talking an awful lot of money, though, John. You talking know, the, a, anticipation of sixty-eight million dollars over the ten-year you know, period. You know, that's thing. after that's after expenses, and I, you know. The other thing that needs to be clarified a little bit too, Roy, is that the uh, center mall parking. No one's ever been allowed to park there all day. Uh, we have always historically had specials out there that used to mark tires and and check, the, check those things all the time for, for a two hour parking limit. So there's always been a two hour parking limit. This just makes it a lot more efficient to be able to check those things because as soon as a car becomes over timed parking, you get a system warning saying where, they, where the cars are over parked, over turn parked. So Ron, what you've been doing that, what was the income from uh, parking fines last year? I don't have that, those numbers available, and I don't even know that they would be available. Uh, uh, because no yeah, because that. they're part of the budget. We well, do have that in part of the budget. It's not. Even, I thought it's not just. I thought be, it was. It's not just going to be one time parking. That's going to be all parking revenue. That's throughout the entire city. What you referenced, I thought what you referenced, you correct me if I'm wrong, was that you said that people parked all day long in the in the center malls, and there was no turnover. In fact, no, I don't. I don't know what what the center mall, you know, where these numbers were taken. I'm assuming it was all 1350 spaces, you know, that they, they numbers were taken. So, you know, people parked. It was what I'm saying is, 
you know, this is based on basically a turnover or people paying the entire thing, but it's based on a time when there was no incentive. So they said, well, somebody's parking there this entire time. So we're going to assume that once the money, even with the money being charged, they will continue to park there. Those are what the numbers are based on. Now, the only Ron, thing I was trying to clarify was that there was yeah. parking enforcement always taking place during those times. Some of the meters, are thir- some of the spots are 30 minutes. Some of the spots are, 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 are an hour. Some of them are two hour. And the specials walk those areas all summer long and all, all year long and issue summonses for that. So, the, so Right, right. Yeah. Uh, then that's why I'm asking. They've been issuing summonses and I'm just wondering what our income is from those summonses now before we're talking about yeah from my understanding they've never been tracked just for specifically for those things there was revenue that was generated for parking summonses and revenue that's been generated for moving summonses that we get reported back but never in the center of town it was the entire city okay okay so i guess like so so basically you know we have a parking fine uh parking fine budgeted line item, which is probably an aggregated number, which we probably don't have a specific three down at this time, sure. but I'm sure Ina and Ron can look into that. I'm okay, but right that. now, there's no way to tell. Right now, we're right. anticipating $648,000 in parking points, $624,000. Yes, that, that's $624, correct. $624,000 in parking points. I'm just, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out. It's a lot that goes into those is. parking fines, Roy. Some of the parking fines may end up going to court and they're dismissed. Um, so that is something that we can take a look at and just say we can't give it to you by area, but we can give you an estimate of where we were going to be for parking fines. Um, right, Donna, that's what pay- this, this, this presentation has an estimate. Of six hundred um, well, uh, twenty-four right, hundred. Right, it has an estimate for the center, for the center of town. Yes. When we talk right. about parking fines in the budget, it is not broken out by the areas in town. And so, I guess where I'm a little confused by your question is that if a person parks there twelve hours, they have to pay. If Correct. and if there was no incentive, they didn't have to pay. Therefore, there's no Correct. revenue to the city. And then if Correct. they receive the ticket, it is not guaranteed that they're going to have to pay the entire amount of the summons if they go to court. So Correct. I guess- that's, that's 17% was the number that they figured for that, right. that there would okay. be a reduction of 17% according right, to please, these right, numbers. Please, for, right, please forgive me for interjecting. Um, I actually yes. um, understand, I actually uh, understand your point and agree with you that um, an estimate of about over a half a million dollars in fines per year may be a little bit aggressive and ask that the city staff um, work with Jerry to make sure that that's an appropriate assumption and see if you want, might want to check it, you know, just check it one more time for us, please. Okay. Will do. Th- we'll do. Does that help, Roy? Do you have any further questions? Yeah, yeah no, that, that helps. I'm trying Thank to, you. Uh, yeah, yeah, just a couple more. Second. The on one of the slides you showed us, you did have uh, the Memorial Day um, uh, date as realistic, but you you seem to say that that's a little bit aggressive at this point. Can you give us a little bit more on that? I mean, it. Yeah, I mean, that's based on based on what we heard tonight. It seems impossible but you think it still could be possible that's that that's the target date that we were given we are gunning for it um it, it's aggressive how realistic it is at this stage of the game um is certainly in question um but we're looking we're looking to move forward and bring something online um council willing um as expeditiously as possible so you know it it, it depends on how how quickly this process moves through here um flowbird certainly you know, knows what its build out time is, so to speak. And I, I don't fully mean build out, but then there's the back end systems as well. So there, there's a reality that we're playing with. Um, you know, Memorial Day is we got a we got a super tight window right now if we're getting there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next question.
Anybody? Because I, I just have a couple more. Oh, Liz can go ahead. I have one yeah. as well, but I'll wait till the yeah, end. Yeah, I have a couple, but since Roy's got a hard stop, let's let Roy no, get that's, this. No, please. I'm, you know, we got to get this done. So, All right. Th thank you, Roy. Um, let's let's move. Let's rotate a little bit. I have some questions too. Um, Liz, you haven't had an opportunity to ask any questions. Yeah, my question is regarding the app. Um, I've downloaded and have played with it as well, and. I see here that they have a calendar of events. That's some, so say I wanted to, that Bright Eyes having a concert or a, a trio of jazz singers, would we be able to, or would the Bright Eye or the event coordinator be able to contact the city and say, I'm having this event. Can you put it in the calendar so that people can look at the parking spaces that show up, but what's available at that time. Sean, that, Sean Ed, you guys, uh, what's that interface look like? Yeah, I could take that. Um, yeah, so we work with a, uh, a reservations uh, system that allows for parking reservations at typically off street parking locations. Um, so if that interface is available, then, then we could bring it to Long Beach and it, and it kind of connects the events in the area and there is a configuration to allow for um, special events to be you know, added there. Um, so it's just something we'd have to look at with our parking reservations uh, system there. Okay, that I just need to uh, establish how that was made. Anything else? Go ahead, you can go, Tina. Um, I just had a, a question. Um, from my understanding in previous conversations, the city was granted about 500,000 for this project. And is there a place where the costs to implement the systems above this amount is defined? Like I know we have a certain amount. But so, like, yeah. so it was, we were uh, financial restructuring board um, has allocated the city up to $500,000 um, towards this project. And that's actually not baked into, <laughs> we, we don't like to assume anything. Um, and we've been working on this for a while. So that's not baked into Jerry's analysis. So, you know, as we move forward, we will, we will bake it in and um, move it out. Thank you. I have a, I have a related question um, to that point, Tina. Um, so the projected or estimated uh, vendor recruitment amount is 3.8 million through the you know, uh, vendor finance model. And then um, with the bond financing structure, the proposed bonding amount is, seems to be $1.2 million that we would borrow. Yeah, so uh, I think- that's, I think six. I, that's correct. So- I, can you walk me through the difference? Yes, the, 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 the 3.8 million uh, includes the vendor's operating expenses as well as their developmental and financing expenses. So, um, you know, so, so there's, there's a lot of cost to pull this all together. Um, and, and also there's, there's risk involved on their part. Um, which they've also baked into that estimate of the 3.8. So between the financing, the risk, and their operating expenses, um, you know, we're paying that extra money as a result. So what what exactly in comparison will we be borrowing for in the 1.2 million? Is that uh, their development costs? Is that the fee, the Flowbird fee? Uh, Sean or Ed, do you want to? You know, you gave us that estimate in terms of the, the one-time cost. Does that include um, all the the development of the back office and the integration of all the systems? The one-time cost, um, as opposed to the financing. Correct. For the revenue share. Like how do we compare it? Yeah. So I'm looking at the um, details on that now. So that, yeah, I mean, it, you're, you're basically getting all the pay stations, um, you're getting, you're getting the enforcement system. Um, and 
yeah, you're basically getting everything. You're just paying up front for it as opposed to us taking the risk that the revenue is not enough to cover the, the cost of the system, basically. So we're in the first model where we're talking about um, a revenue share. We're basically input, we're installing the whole system for you and operating it for you um, and then taking the risk that the revenue comes in to cover it. Um, whereas in the model where we are getting the money up front, we're doing everything the same. Um, we're just, uh, we're not, we're just getting paid up front for it. Okay. I think I, I think I get it. Okay. Um, John, did you have any questions, any more questions? Uh, yeah. Um, just this one's a, a kind of a simple one, but uh, since the machines take cash, who collects the cash from the kiosks? The, the operator, so the vendor would, would be collecting the cash. So vendor for years one through five and then the city six through 10? Well, the, the city or the, or the operator that the city engages. But, there, but it's, the, the, the machines know and the back office tells you, will tell us exactly how much is in every meter every time that door opens, every time a cash drawer is taken out. So the internal controls in a system like this are, um, are, are really high level. So uh, there's, there's, there's virtually uh, no risk of, of theft in, in a system like this. No yeah, more quarter good. scandals, Mr. Benda. Well, I was going to say, what, yeah, what's the security of these? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they're not high cash value targets, but. Uh, so so, so the, the, actual, the actual meters themselves, the cash that's actually collected in the meters, like you said, the vendor's gonna collect them. I, I did not wanna get involved in the, ca uh, the cash collection business in the police department. I ran that in Finesse County for a while. It's, it's a, a lot of logistics and a lot, a lot of different things come into play with it, but uh, the, the security is borne by them. They're collecting it. They're responsible to make sure that we get it. So, okay. you know, it's not, it's not our cross the bear, so to speak. And just, I would just a real quick add on too is, I mean, our, our, our original wish was, was to eliminate cash entirely, but you know, as a society, I don't think we're there yet that we can expect everybody to have a credit card or be able to do it via the app. Um, so, you know, moving forward, we could transition away from cash. Um, and that's likely the way this thing goes. Well, but that creates, that creates an issue. If a credit card requires a $1 minimum, if somebody's running into wherever CVS for 10 minutes to grab something and wants to put a dime in the meter, you know, to give themselves 10 minutes, they're going to do that but it, rather than we did that anyway, though. Didn't we build in a 10 minute grace period in this, Jerry? No, no, yes. we... only for 15 meters. They're 15 meters. Well, that, that was another minutes. thing I was looking for clarity on. Are all meters a 10 minute grace period? Or is it just those uh, 15 identified uh, spots? A grace period is very difficult to enforce. I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you know, the being able to put a nickel or a dime in is, um, you know, as an alternative, I think is, is probably the best way to go. All right. So you're, you're proposing we not do a 10 minute grace period that I, let I him throw a nickel in there for a few minutes. Correct. Logistically, it's very difficult to, to pull off. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so regarding the, the, the fees we get, um, Ina had mentioned something earlier about the possibility of creating a separate account for these funds. Is there, I mean, and I know we're very early in the process, but uh, have we given thought to, do we want to put some of these funds in a lockbox to, to gear it towards uh, whatever it is, infrastructure, road repair? And also, the other reason I bring that up is if the estimate is that the system, the equipment lasts 10 years, then in year 11, we could be potentially looking at a, let's take the 3.8 and adjust it up for inflation. We could be looking at a four and a half 
<clears throat> or a $5 million outlay for equipment upgrades in year 11, which without putting money aside, we could be back to, we got a bond for it or you know, perhaps a new revenue sharing agreement or whatever the case may be. <clears throat> Or we plan accordingly by putting some funds, you know, in a lockbox, you know, for this. So those are above my, so I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, John. Um, those, those are questions that are above my pay grade. I think we'd go to the council, go, go to the no, secretary. I was going to say, I, was gonna say I, I agree with you, John. What we could do is we can come up with a policy that so much money that comes in has to go be restricted for... Uh, future improvements or whatever. Um, and then that's how that's done. So but the yeah. governing body can, um, only governing body, which is the city council, can implement restrictions. So the-, the Right, so that would be in the policy that the, that the body would pass. So the other way to handle the two was, the other way to handle the two, which was discussed, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit, little bit lagged, so I start talking sometimes, and then it, it catches up. So I don't mean to talk over anybody. I apologize. Um, the other way to handle it too, what we talked about when this was in our maintenance program, building in software and hardware refreshes inside the maintenance program, so that as we're going along, we're automatically paying Flowbird to do that for us. So that in year five, we might get a software uh, refresh. In year six and seven, we get a hardware refresh of the meters. In year ten. We've already paid for the meter, so it's already included in the fees in the in the negotiations inside the actual contract that we signed with them. But that hasn't been brought up yet because that isn't the model that we looked for uh, going into this. That's something that'll come out in the negotiation. So there's a lot of different ways to handle it, and it's something that we did in radio projects and many other things. Where as we're going along and equipment starts to age out, it's already into the maintenance program, then it's going to be replaced. Well, system maintenance system maintenance is actually in the financials already um, in the out years. So basically, I think, John, you're basically referring to hardware, which, you know, is not the 3.8 million that was a part of the original recoupment. It's less. But yes, you know, right. but it may yeah. not be right. It, it could be. Well, again, depending next generation yeah. equipment, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a cost of some kind. Yes, that's a great point that we should uh, definitely consider. Right, something and, like that. And I guess uh, my my last one for now. Um, so, as far as the permits, we're talking about having employees uh, buy parking permits so they don't have to put money in the meter. Uh, we have two kinds of employees. You know, we have the full time people who are going into their office or their business or whatever, working full time. But then we have also, the high school kid who's bussing tables at a restaurant uh, might only be working 15 hours a week or something like that. Are we applying the same rule to those people about having to buy permits? Or are we going to work something out where the businesses can buy permits for their employees? Or, you know, that, I mean, that could, that could not, all, not all permit holders are the same. That, that, that could definitely be done. I'm working on a permit program right now for downtown Lindenhurst. And that program, the employers are going to be able to purchase um, permits for their employees. And in this case, we're, you know, we're looking at um, the employee parking permit. It's $200 a year, which works out to be um, about $16.67 $16 cents per month, which um, you know, compared with putting the money in the meter, I think is a very modest and fair uh, fee. And I think a lot of the businesses would take advantage of being able to uh, purchase blocks of permits for their employees. They just have to register those plates within the system. Right. Because especially with, with the part-time employees, especially the younger kids, and this is going to be especially prevalent in the summertime, you know, during the Memorial Day, the Labor Day window is th these these kids come and go, you know, as, as far as these employees, you know, they, they, they come in, they work uh, for a while, they're gone, new employees are in, new employees are out. So, um, you know, a college kid coming home, you know, asking them to buy a, a one year permit when they're only working, you know, uh, June, July and August uh, may leave a bad taste in, in their uh, 
in their mouth. Those, those yeah. permits are going to be bought by the actual establishments, and the and the plates that they can use can change. So as an employee leaves and or a uh, an establishment, they take that plate out and they can replace it with a different plate. And they have a certain number of plates that they're allowed to register. Yeah, and that's yeah. fine. That's fine. If we're going to have, if we're going to discuss with you know having the businesses take on that responsibility for their employees, that's fine. But then there's that's got to be a, a a part of the rollout program or whatever the discussion with the with the businesses uh about giving them that option to do that you know, or you know with um basically it's uh what um over one third of the spaces are uh, in this current and the current assumptions are actually for businesses um this this the, these assumptions are based on information from um 2018 um I really don't have any sort of comparison level to know how many registered businesses we have in this area in 2018 versus now. So, um, you know, I, I'm a little concerned about managing this inventory because this is the discounted inventory, right? Yeah. Well, the other thing too is keep in mind that there are a lot more employees operating in these businesses in the Memorial Day to Labor Day window than there mm -hmm. are in the off season too. You know, these businesses bring in a lot more employees mm -hmm. in the summertime. So that means well, that, they're taking up more spaces. But that brings me to an the, equity the issue. Thing. Like, like, how are you going to base, are you going to base the number of permits a business may purchase on the, on the square footage of a, of a business? I mean, how are you going to create an illicit market for, you know, for these permits? Like so, how- I mean I'm sorry. Uh, there's, there's gonna, there, the, the permits are going to require um, uh, either a, a pay stub or a certification and the um, and the, the vehicle registration. So the tag number can be confirmed and the name can be confirmed either with the certification or the pay stub. So uh, so there are going to be controls in place to uh, minimize the risk of abuse. And, and that's where the fee structure comes into play too. You know, you don't, you want to hit the sweet spot. You don't want it to be punitive, um, but you want to make sure that the, the business owners are keeping things up to date. Um, so they're not losing money on spent tags that are no longer viable for them. Um, and that they give the city an accurate read over how many employees that they have at any given time and how many, how many permitted plates they need at any given time. The other thing, John, is uh, currently we have a, a lot of complaints because there's no long-term parking places for the businesses to park. This actually generates spots where they can park long-term because they now have a permit to do so and it reduces their cost. So basically right. if, if, this, if, this goes, if this goes by a calendar year, it's really um, first come first serve for these 425 permits that are gonna be purchased each year. So basically, I'm going to put all these people on my books in January so that I have enough spaces in, uh, in June. Because uh, I, I, even though they won't be getting a paycheck until June, because I, my well, business is seasonal. Right. Or do we sell seasonal permits? That's another question. That remains to be seen. I think that whole thing remains to be seen how we're going to structure that. The, the Jerry, do you, Jerry, did you have want to say something? Uh, yeah, two things. Uh, you know, first of all, you know, as John mentioned earlier, this is a living, breathing thing. Uh, that 497 is my best guess based on sadly doing parking studies for over 30 years. That's my best guess as to what your employee demand is going to be. Uh, also, because the rate is very modest, we're going to have people buying business permits for convenience. So we might sell 700 of these permits, but we'll only find maybe 350 parked at the peak. And I've seen this in commuter lots and employee lots in, in, in towns all over the Northeast. So, um, so the, the, way to, the way to deal with it is to monitor your, the actual demand that's generated. And so this adjustments accordingly. So um, Donna, um, good evening. Um, which, which department would actually manage these, uh, monitor and manage the, uh, permit issuance for, uh, for, you know, business parking? It actually would be the city clerk's office. 
the they do all of the parking right now. Okay. So, um, so let me. Let but me it, it would be monitored by by all by police okay. and finance, but they would issue the permits. Okay. So Thank so you. let's let's take. I think a, Dave a, just fell out of his chair. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a larger establishment, maybe like one of our large uh, mm -hmm. bar restaurants that mm -hmm. maybe has, let's say they have 50 employees, but at any given time, only 10 employees may actually be working. Can they buy 10 permits and say, but I'm only going to be using, I may, I, may have, I may register 50 plates, but at any given time, only 10 would be there at a, at a time, or is that even possible, or would they have to buy a permit per plate? That's that, that's a great question. Um, you can it, you have to have a plate number attached so that they are part of the system, and the, when the LPRs read them. Now you can have two plates attached to one permit, but they will not be allowed to park at the same time. So if if, if I hit plate A B C one two three. Uh, on a particular day, and there's another permit on, and there's another tag on that same permit, and I read that plate as well, they're going to get a ticket. All right. So, so it sounds like we need to give some thought to how to accommodate a business that, again, like I said, may have 50 employees, but at any given time, only 10 may be working. You can also and, structure it, John, with the permits on any given time, you're only allowed to have. 10 cars from that business allowed to park there. Well, that, that's what I'm yeah. saying. But, but, yeah, but, but that, yeah, but so that was, that's the whole point. How do you really, how, how do you, you track say that? one business can get 10 permits and another business can only get five? No, they that's can buy a hundred permits. It's, they can buy a hundred permits, but at any given time, you can limit the number of people from that establishment that can park there. It's, so let us, I think, I think that's a great Lance. flag. I, I, I think you get my point though. Uh, you may not have the answer right now, but I think you, you see what I'm getting at. No, it's a um, great flag. Let us, let us take that in-house and uh, come right. back with something. Um, I just want to point out, Jerry, you had said that the permits would be the, the employee permits in the begin in the earlier part of this line of questioning, you had said that the employees would be required to submit a pay stub. But you know, later on, just now when you answered John's questions, you just said they could just submit license plates. So if I were a business owner, I would be just asking all my friends for their license plates and registering in January so I had enough spots for my employees in, in June. Now you would, you would still need to attach a vehicle registration and either a pay stub or a certification to each plate number registered for your business. Okay. So each um, plate number would require either uh, a would definitely require vehicle registration, plus either a certification from the business or or a pay stub. A certification, uh, you know, that would be notarized. That correct. Yeah. You know, yeah. So um, my last question around um, the permit parking um, has to do with the fact that we I think the city has secured a grant around um, transit development related to the railroad. And I was wondering how, um, John McNally, how that was incorporated into this plan. Um, with that particular grant is it's, it's really for the design phase to the best of my knowledge at this stage of the game. We didn't ask Patty to come on to this. So it's related, but a little bit far afield. Um, and it, it's really, you know, it's, it's wayfinding, it's, it's aesthetic and, and flow improvements. So I think mm -hmm. in terms of parking inventory, we're not it's probably not a related issue at this stage of the game or just the placement of the kiosks. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's where the kiosks are going to be not in the center malls. Uh, they're going to be on the corners uh, of basically each of the blocks. So, you know, the, the center malls are not a destination. So why are you putting them there? Um, so they're going to be, you're, you're not parking in the center malls to be in the parking in the, in the center malls. Um, you're parking there in order to get to, you know, a curbside. So they will be on each curb. I, I don't think, um, we'll flag it and look at it, but I don't think it's going to be affected um, between the two. Okay. Um, Roy, I think it's your turn. No, I, I'm going to have to go, Karen, so I'm, I'm going to leave my questions for the next time. Okay. Like I said, there's plenty of bites at this apple. Yeah. And Roy, you know you can always send us your questions and then we can discuss them the next time as well. Oh, I know. Okay. Ask, ask poor John because he gets them. 
And the residents can also uh, reach out, right, for questions. A hundred percent. Either you know, city manager at, at LongBeachNY.gov or Jay McNally at LongBeachNY.gov. And as noted, there's going to be um, a number of bites of the apple where public input at regular council meetings will be will be not just available but welcomed. I had a question um, for the uh, for the app or I guess uh, the uh, LB register resident registration. What makes you a Long Beach resident? I'm not sure. Oh, so I mean, you would need to have the same way that you sort of prove it for a beach pass. So you need to have, you know, you need to have a current utility bill. Your license needs to, you know, reflect. And it's, it, this is an annual annual registration. So just because Karen McGinnis signed up for um, and passed the test to be a resident in 2022 does not mean that you will be a resident for life. You need to, you need to prove it each year. Can, can we be a little bit rigor, rigorous on that? And, you know, because this is, you know, this is the issue we're having with, you know, people that pay taxes to live here and people that don't. Okay, so we'll, we'll definitely examine criteria to make sure that it's as uh, foolproof as possible. Any other questions from the council? I have just a final question perhaps for Jerry. Uh, have we asked the most asked question that you have received in your <laughs> years of experience? <coughs> Are we missing something? Uh, no, actually, that was a very comprehensive uh, uh, coverage of uh, most of the key points, really. Thank you. This has been very, <clears throat> very helpful. I just want to thank everybody for being on the call today. Um, this is a lot, of, a lot to consider. Um, Thank you to Flowbird as well um, for all your uh, for all your help. And um, John McNally, I leave it to you. Until the next time, and there will be several next times. So uh, appreciate you all. All right. Thank you. Have a good. Thank you, Thank you everyone. See you next Tuesday at our city council meeting. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night.